Kelly, Kelly Jensen, everyone. All right, following Pirates, I'd like to welcome uh, Frederick Lightning Lice to the stage to talk about a lady of adventure who is another kind of inspiration for our captainess, Maria Sibylla Marion. Please welcome Lightning. So I'm Lightning, and I'm here to tell you about a scientist who emerged from her cocoon and basically founded the field of entomology. So metamorphosis, why was she on the 500 Deutschmark note? Let's go to the turn of the century and find out. So, not that one. Or that one. Or even this one, although we're getting closer. So, Amsterdam in 1699, we finally dialed it in. Now, this is not an explosion in a paint factory. This is what the Holy Roman Empire looked like at the end of the Thirty Years' War. The uh, quip at the time was it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. <laughs> Maria Zabila Marian was born near the end of the Thirty Years' War, which in one generation cut the population of the German-speaking lands in Central Europe in half. By the time she was in her early 20s, she had published her first book, which was a series of illustrations of flowers and often with insects, based on observation, which was unpopular at the time because people said, Aristotle already did the observation. We know what it is. We don't need to do it again. This particular Augustus bulb with the uh, the so-called broken tulip, at the time, at the height of tulipomania, sold for the price of a house. The, unfortunately for the punters who bought one, they did not breed true because, as they didn't know at the time, the <coughs> broken tulip was caused by a virus. Here are some of her illustrations. As you can see, she liked to include insects. and sometimes other fauna. Now, all of the work that she did was done in watercolor and gouache. And why was that? Why were there no oils? Well, the guild, the painter's guild, was an old boys network. No women need apply. And only members of the guild could paint in oil. Her second book, could be summarized as more flowers and insects. When she was 13, she was keeping an eye on some silkworms and she wondered what would happen if instead of boiling the cocoons to make silk, I left them alone. Well, what happened is that moths emerged from the cocoons <clears throat> laid eggs, which hatched into silkworms, which after several molts, spun cocoons and repeated the cycle. And this was metamorphosis. Before her time, people often didn't see the connection between caterpillars and butterflies. <laughs> Not long after that, she left her husband and joined a commune. <laughs> she took her mother and her two daughters, definitely not her husband. The, uh, these were called Lobotists, and they were founded by a priest who became an extreme Protestant. And people who visited the commune said everyone there had that smug air of superiority of people who know that they are the elect, and you and everyone else are going straight to hell. 
<laughs> so all, <laughs> all property had to be surrendered to the commune and was held in common. She stood that for about five years, and after five years, she left the commune, she was able to get most of her property back, and she moved to Amsterdam, where she taught the unmarried daughters of the rich and famous Amsterdamers. So, for example, Nicholas Whitson, who was the mayor of Amsterdam, a trustee of the dreaded Dutch East India Company, the VOC. He was a fellow, I shouldn't have said UK Royal Society, because the act of union with Scotland had not occurred. There was no Great Britain, certainly no United Kingdom at that point, the, so the English Royal Society. He was also a friend of Peter the Great. In fact, he got him a job in a shipyard in disguise, although Peter the Great was something like six foot eight. It was kind of hard to, to disguise him. So Nicholas Whitson published a map of what he called East Tartary, Siberia, and he had a cabinet of curiosities. So <laughs> the, uh, this map includes at the top Nova Zemlaya, which gives us our word Zemblanity, which is kind of the opposite of serendipity. It's an extreme Murphy's Law where everything that can possibly go wrong goes wrong in the worst possible way. <laughs> this is not his actual cabinet of curiosities, but it is emblematic. You know, unlike Aldovani's, his did not survive. And as Aneta has said, cabinets of curiosity were all the rage at the time. And in German, they were known as Wunderkammers. One of the gentlemen whose daughters he, she taught was Dr. Frederick Roisch, who, let's say, was not squeamish. <laughs> he made dioramas, which for me are nightmare fuel, but to each his own. Now back to the dreaded Dutch East India Company, of which Mayor Witsen was a trustee. They were the original cutthroat capitalists. They wiped out the entire population of a nutmeg-producing island in an attempt to corner the market on nutmeg. They traded another island, which was temporarily under English control, for New York, because nutmeg was worth more than the entire city of New Amsterdam. The uh, Dutch were the only nation to maintain a trading post in Japan after Christianity was abolished there. When the Japanese emerged from isolation, which the Americans must have thought was a good idea at the time, and we won't talk about Pearl Harbor, they were astonished to find that English and not Dutch was the language of science. Now, less well known than the Dutch East India Company, but just as cut cutthroat, was the West India Company. Now, Dutch Empire at the time of Maria Zabila Marian, you might say, why is it that if South Africa is part of the East India Company, why is it that West Africa falls under the West Indies? Well, at the time that they settled Suriname, when the native population found out exactly what was involved in a sugar plantation, they got in their canoes, headed upstream, out of reach. The Dutch needed a labor force, and they found one in West Africa. So Suriname Company had three shareholders the city of Amsterdam, so we're back to Mayor Whitson, the von Sommelsdijk family, and the Dutch West India Company. At the age of 52, Maria decided to travel with one of her grown daughters to Suriname, risking shipwreck, scurvy, and piracy, because sea travel was hardly guaranteed at the time. She arrived in Suriname not long after that. The first governor was killed in a mutiny. 
He was survived by three sisters who perhaps coincidentally were all Labadists from that same commune. <laughs> now, the climate in Suriname is damp. <laughs> Maria Zabila Marian was absolutely horrified by slavery. Nevertheless, here's a coastal plantation that, again, perhaps coincidentally, was owned by the Labadists. The worst nightmare of the planters were the so-called Maroons, slaves who escaped and armed themselves, formed tribes. Nine of those tribes still exist in Suriname and they raided the plantations. Meanwhile, Maria Zabila Marian spoke to the locals and got a lot of her information about the flora and fauna of Suriname from them. The planters couldn't understand why anybody would talk to an Indian, just didn't see the point. She intended to stay for five years, but after two years having contracted malaria, she went back to Amsterdam and published her magnum opus, which was a metamorphosis of the insects of Suriname. And you could say more flowers, <laughs> more insects and other fauna. Now, recently, a tarantula in Peru was named for her, Avicularia Mariani, in honor of the work she had done classifying tarantulas, including the infamous bird-eating spider. And in case there are any arachnophobes here, I decided not to include that particular slide. <laughs> now, she was very well recognized as an artist in her time for her illustration. She was collected by Peter the Great, also by the British royal family. And when I, including the then Prince of Wales, later Mad King George. Now, when I see this particular picture of King George, I like to imagine somebody riding up to him, covered in mud, <laughs> stained, and saying, your majesty, your subjects are revolting. Oh, so I see. <laughs> Now, Rachel Rausch was the daughter of Dr. Frederick Rausch. She was a pupil of Maria Zabila Marian, also the first female member of the Painters Guild in The Hague. I like to think that Maria had something to do with breaking that particular taboo. But I will leave the last word to Goethe in very rough translation. Her art and science bridged observation and portrayal. And here she is, and you'll have to imagine a virtual glass. I would like to raise my virtual glass to Maria Zabila Marian for having, at the age of 52, decided to travel across the world and through observation establish the science of entomology. Thank you.